Hello again, and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is Jesse, and I am back for a periodic video that I will occasionally do, and I found out that it's been quite a while since I have done one of these. Um, I've been asked a lot recently about what I would recommend for smartphone apps, more specifically iPhone apps, <clears throat> as a blind or low vision user. And I have done a couple of these videos in the past, and believe it or not, the last one I did was in 2018. I thought I did one way later than that, but apparently not. And uh, if you look them up, they're under, I believe, the Assistive Technology playlist, and um, they are the, the the videos are apps. What was it accessible apps for independence or something like that? Um, and like I said, there are so many things that you can do with a smartphone or even a tablet, you know, especially with iOS, because iPhone and iPad, a lot of the apps now are universal. So a lot of the things that you can do, uh, you can do on either. Now, a lot of these I will do on my phone because I don't want to carry around a big old slab with me. Um, and, you know, your phone also, unless you spend a lot of money and get the um, cellular version of an iPad, you have the advantage of, you know, some of the apps will take advantage of your data connection. So, you know, if you're out in the world somewhere, you're not near any Wi-Fi, you can still access some of these assistive tools or GPS information, all those types of things. So let's just get right into it here. Um, what I'm just going to do is I'm, you know, and a lot of these apps, <clears throat> this is more of an introduction, an overview and this is in November 2023. So if you are curious about any of these apps, I would encourage you to check out the iOS Accessible App Spotlight playlist. And I will try to remember to put a link in the description below. So if you want to see any of these apps in more detail, um, I have done probably at least one video on all of these apps. So it's not really good. This video isn't going to be so much of a demonstration. This is going to be an introduction. It's going to be an overview. We're going to go through some things by category. And this is really meant for um, people who are new to smartphones, people who might be new to iOS. And I just want to show you the the extensive capabilities that we have, um, whether you're in school or you're in college or you're in you're working, maybe you just want to be able to read, you want to be able to navigate your environment. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. I mean, it's and most of it is free, you know. And if it's not, it's a reasonable price, you know. You, there may be one or two apps that have subscriptions, but um, you know, once you have the phone. Yeah, okay, maybe you spend a little bit more on a phone. I know, you know, Android is generally a little bit cheaper. Um, but I was having the discussion with um, a friend of mine not too long ago. And the thing with Android is they have gotten way better. And there are alternatives to a lot of these apps that I'm going to cover on iOS. Some of them aren't there, but some of them there are alternatives. But with Android, you have to be very careful, especially as an assistive technology user. If you are a blind or low vision user, and you know, even though this is going to be concentrated on, on iOS, I want to um, basically I want to give this message to any would-be Android users right up front here. As I said, be careful what Android phone <clears throat> or even tablet you get. Um, because on iOS, there's kind of a baseline of specs. There's a baseline of quality of touchscreen. You know, even if I buy last year's model, even if I buy, let's say, an iPhone SE that is more the entry-level model, the touchscreen is still going to be solid. It's You're still going to, when you do your gestures, um, you're going to have a level of consistency and reliability, um, there. 
Android is a little bit different because there are so many different brands, so many different manufacturers, price ranges. I mean, yeah, you can get a bargain basement Android phone for maybe 150, 200 bucks. But, you know, the old saying goes, you get what you pay for. And you get Swipe what you down, don't pay it. for in this case because, you know, when I had the Nexus 7 tablet back in the day, yeah, it was an interesting thing to experiment with just to learn Android back in the day. But even then, like, I found the touchscreen to be a little... Mm, it left a little bit to be desired because I would do gestures and they just wouldn't register all the time. Like, I know how to do a gesture uh, and they wouldn't always consistently register. And especially if you are new to an operating system, new to an assistive technology tool, um, if you're doing something correctly and it's not working, it, it can confuse you, it can frustrate people. Um, so the other thing that I would say is, again... Um, the specs on some of these lower end Android phones. The other thing you have to remember is, you know, when you get, even if you read a review uh, from a mainstream tech website or podcast or video, they are looking at it from an average sighted user where they're running their apps and they're doing their thing. Oh, I'm going to search the internet. Oh, I'm going to look up something. I'm going to check my email. I'm going to watch a YouTube video, do whatever. But remember, as blind or visually impaired users, we are often using a screen reader on top of everything else. Or we're using a magnification gesture, like zoom on the iPhone, or um, the magnification gestures on Android. Um, <clears throat> you know, voiceover on iOS, talk back on Android. And just like if you have a really low-end computer, if you try to run JAWS or NVDA or even, you know, magnifier or zoom text, it's going to run like hot garbage. So you have to, you know, you may not need the Cadillac. You may not need the top-of-the-line device. But I, I really discourage people from going the complete low-end because you are going to regret it. Um, and it's probably going to, you know, like, if again, if you have a frustrating experience... It's going to turn you off of using that type of device, and then you'll just assume, oh, well, no, Android sucks, or iPhone sucks. Um, so I really want to encourage people, if you're going to go Android, at least go with a mid-range device. And the Pixel devices are a good starting point because they are, you know, they were from Google themselves. They generally meet a pretty good spec, um, I've got a Pixel 5 that I'm using through work that I'm using to kind of play with and test Android a bit. Um, and it's pretty good. So, you know, you know, it doesn't have a lot of extra weird fluff or, you know, some manufacturers on Android will put extra like user interfaces like Samsung will often put their own sort of skin on things, uh, and they'll behave a little bit differently. I know Samsung phones are really popular. Uh, and they generally do work well. But again, do not go with a bargain basement phone. I've watched a couple reviews of, you know, just some just some trash phones out there that even when you're not using assistive technology, the lag, the performance, the responsiveness is just awful. And if you were trying to also then run TalkBack or anything else on top of that, um, it is not going to be a good experience for you. So... Android or iOS, that is my kind of warning, that is my disclaimer, that is my PSA for the day. Getting back to iOS, so what I'm going to do here is I have everything divided up into folders. And, you know, again, if you are new to an iPhone, new to an iPad, you're like, whoa, you know, I don't really want a phone, I don't care about phones, why do I want a phone? Because... Phones are, to me these days, I would say phone. the phone part is actually incidental. Yeah, I make phone calls on occasion, but these phones are just amazing handheld computers at this point. <clears throat> and even, you know, whether it's Android or iOS, they have a lot of built-in tools already. I already mentioned iOS has VoiceOver, which is their built-in screen reader. It's very, very good. Um... Android has TalkBack. It's also quite good. It's gotten quite good. 
Um, another disclaimer, I would say it's gotten better, but Braille support on Android, um, I've still heard leaves a lot to be desired. So if you really, really want to focus on Braille accessibility, eh, you might want to go iOS for now. It's getting better, um, but from what I heard, it's it still needs work. I haven't really played with Braille all that much recently on Android. I know it's improved some, but, you know, there you go. So you have magnif built-in magnification. You have built-in Zoom, or you have built-in um, screen reader. <clears throat> now, on iOS, um, you also have... A feature so if I'm if I'm in Same. iOS let me just show you really quickly I'll show you where the settings are if I go into Same. my settings app here and General I scroll button. down control center display and home screen and app library accessibility button and it's in the main uh, menu of settings I just go into accessibility Vision, this is where you're gonna want to look the first thing that you're gonna want to do is look in here uh, because there are categories for not just blind and low vision but all kinds of other uh, impairments or disabilities or whatever. Uh, you have a lot of uh, deaf and hard of hearing features. You have like mobility. In, um, well, let me do my heading Physical here. And motor, heading. Physical and motor. Hearing. Heading. Hearing. Speech. Heading. Speech. General. Heading. And I'm not going to go through all these because we'll be here all day. But there's a lot of stuff here. Heading not found. And then you also, at the very bottom, one thing I want to draw your attention to on iOS specifically, button. Accessibility shortcut. Voiceover. you have button. two things now. You have accessibility shortcut and you have per app settings. These are really cool because if there's a feature that you use regularly, like I use voiceover regularly, but I don't use it all the time. So you can set your triple click the side button your, your lock button, essentially, <clears throat> and you can say, do I want that to be voiceover? Do I want that to be Zoom? Do I want that to be some other accessibility feature? And if you want to have a choice of a multiple options, you can check multiple options, and then when you do that triple click, it will ask you if you want to enable or disable the features that you have checked. I leave it at one just because I want it to be quick and simple. Um, but like I said, that's how you do quick, ac quick access to these accessibility features you use most. Um, app settings button. Per app settings is a new thing from a couple iOS versions ago where you can now basically, um, like I use the example um, where there's a couple of apps that don't honor my dark theme. And I'm not going to show them to you because they are financial apps and uh, security, you know, that kind of a thing. I don't we need any of that. Um, but, you know, they were these, um, you know, apps that I would use to pay my bills or to do my banking or whatnot. And they didn't have a dark mode. So what I could do is I could say, well, when I open this app, turn and only this app, turn on the invert colors mode. So normally everything will be in dark mode. Everything life is good. But when I open that bright white finance app that I use, it will turn the um, invert colors feature on so that normal white, bright white background will be dark and uh, light text. And then when I leave the app, it'll go back to normal and boom, I'll be back in my regular dark theme. So these are two um, pretty powerful things that you can do. The other thing that you can do is there is an accessibility shortcut. Um, I forget exactly what it's called now. Um, but you can do these back tap gestures. So you can double tap or triple tap the back of your device. And it's almost like another accessibility shortcut like this, um, you know, triple tap the side button. So, you know, if you wanted to have one shortcut, let's say you wanted voiceover to be your side button, and then you wanted like magnifier or you wanted some other feature to be on the back tap you could do that so th they've really expanded the way you can customize and use accessibility features but let me scroll all the way up here um so under you know like i said under the vision stuff you have voiceover very good screen reader zoom off button zoom this is this is not um you know the the communication thing that everybody uses now this is what they call their magnifier that magnifies everything on the screen. So Zoom is like, think about it like Windows Magnifier or Zoom Text. That's what Zoom is. Display and text size button. 
You can do display and text size. Motion button. You can turn off motion settings. So if you want to turn off some of the animations and stuff. Spoken content button. Spoken content. Some people, maybe they want some speech when they want it, but they don't want, um, they don't want full screen reader all the time. This is a good intermediate. So if I go in Taking here, feedback. you have, up here when you select text. I can do, speak selection. Switch I can do a off. speak selection. Tap to so I can drag my finger and just select what I want it to read aloud. Or speak I can screen. do Switch button. Off. Um, speak screen. Sw speak, uh, speak, button. speak screen. And that's where basically you can just, you know, let's say you're in a big screen that has uh, a document or an email or an article, and you can literally just do a two finger swipe down and go, and then it'll just read that whole screen. So it's kind of a thing of, you know, people don't want their device to talk all the time, but maybe they want to save their eyes a little bit and have longer things still read aloud. Um, that is one way that they can do that. And then there's some extra speech settings and stuff. Now, I, oh, I mentioned there is a zoom feature, but there's also a magnifier feature. Now, that is what turns your phone into a really high quality, actually, high quality CCTV or video magnifier. Now, I'm going to back out of accessibility. Display and control center button. Control center. Now, under settings, and I go to control center, so I'll show you the way the I do it. You, you don't, you don't want to go into settings all the time to get at it. So what I do is I find it, I go under Control Center, and there's a whole ton of apps that you can add to your Control Center. And I'll show you the Control Center in a second. And, um, you know, you basically, you would just go through this list, find Magnifier, and then flick to the left one if you're using VoiceOver. So if I... Screen recording. Reorder Apple TV remote button. Remove screen recording. So... Insert home. Insert guided access. Insert home. So yeah, in, you see how it says insert? If I were to double tap on any of these, um, it would add it to my control center. So there's some things I have included. There's a lot of other things that I don't have included because I don't want things too cluttered. But now, let's say that I've added magnifier. I'll go Doc, home. Settings. And double now if I open. swipe now if I swipe down with voiceover, if I swipe down control a little center. bit here, Airplane mode. here's Switch your up. control center where your, your, your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth, volume locks, um, you know, your lock rotation, brightness, all of those things are there. And on the bottom, magnifier button, hearing devices, magnifier button. I have a magnifier icon. So now I don't, I never have to go into settings again. Anytime I want to turn my phone into a CCTV, I just magnifier, double tap viewfinder, magnifier image. or I turn my, ma voiceover I turn voice over off and here we go. Hey, check out my cool, uh, real, um, first person shooter DVD there. I can, Pinch to zoom, I can so I can use this as a CCTV and it works wonderfully. It works. I use this like every single day, at least once or twice. Um, you know, everyone carries their phone with them everywhere anyway. You know, you're out somewhere or you just need to read something at home, you need to read something at work, or and, and you know, with the, the distance cameras on these phones, they're good. And so if you need to read a sign that's way up higher. Or you need to read, you know, maybe you're, you're at like, a, I don't know, like a fast food place and they have those menus that are behind the counter. Um, you know, I've used it to read marquees, um, like theater marquees, when standing on the sidewalk. Or I've looked at things, you know, that were a little bit further away. You can zoom in pretty far. Um, and the magnifier, I should mention, you know, you do have these settings here. Um I can change the color, you know, so I have it on full color right now, but I can change, you know, just like a CCTV, do I want white on black, yellow and blue? You know, they've got a lot of presets there. So all, everything I've shown you is all built into the iPhone already. We haven't even gotten to the apps, the meat of this video yet. So let me turn voiceover back on because it will help on. other Absolutely. people as Double we're doing this here. And uh, it'll help me kind of remember things here. So let me go over to my second five. screen here. And I break everything down into categories. Um, oh, one other built-in feature that I should mention that is actually very helpful sometimes. You also have a built-in feature called voice memos. And, you know, if I don't want to fuss with the Bluetooth keyboard, I don't, I don't have one with me, or I don't, you know, I have to type a little bit more and I don't want to just use the on-screen keyboard uh, or the Braille input, <clears throat> I can just go into voice memos and record like a 30 second, two minute, 15 minute, doesn't matter. 
Uh, I can do an hour-long recording if I want to record a whole lecture or a whole meeting. Um, but yeah, there's a really nice uh, digital recorder, uh, audio recorder built into your iPhone or iPad. And there are other apps like um, Just Press Record is another very popular one that works on your iPhone and Apple Watch if you happen to have one of those. So I wanted to give some attention to that because I know a lot of blind, visually impaired people use voice recorders. And your phone's got that too. And it, it works. I use it not a lot, but when I do use it, it's very, very handy. And I and it's a nice tool to have. So under my blindness folder, I have a blindness and a low vision blindness folder. folder. So let's go into gaps. blindness real quick. Open blindness folder. Blindness. And I'm not going to go through all the apps, but I'm going to highlight the ones that I especially would recommend for people. You know, because I, I can, you know, again, I have over probably three, four hundred apps on this thing between apps and games and reading services and video and audio, God knows what else. Um, I have loads of apps on here, you know, you know, when I'm testing things and exploring things, I want to keep this manageable. And so I want to recommend apps in just certain categories that can really help people, uh, you know, almost more universally, like, hey, it doesn't matter if you're blind, if you're low vision, these apps are great. So my eyes. Be My Eyes, this one has jumped to right up to the top of my list. Uh, I've covered this app twice already as I'm recording this video, and I may do one final uh, third video on this app where I take a look at charts and graphs and diagrams and things. Um, Be My Eyes is an app where it originally you could connect with a sighted volunteer. You could take a picture of something ask a question, or and then you could be on a live call with somebody with your camera, and they could help you through a visual task. It's a free app. They have volunteers, uh, and it was cool. But then they're right now they're in the process of rolling out a feature called Be My AI that uses, you maybe, you maybe you've heard of ChatGPT or GPT-4. This AI, you can take a picture of something, and it brings back just miraculous amounts of detail. Um, like I'm not easily impressed these days because I've seen countless, you know, assistive technologies and such, but this app has consistently blown me away. Be my eyes, the be my AI feature, pretty dang incredible. You can use it with your camera to take pictures. You can use it to look at pictures from like your web browser, email, social media. You know, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter and you see like, oh, people have posted all these jokes or memes or information and it's just a picture of text, well, now you can just say, no, okay, let's share that text with uh, Be My Eyes, and it will uh, handle that for you. And it does a really, really good job. So Be My Eyes, highly recommend. That is also on Android. Seeing AI, double tap to open. Seeing AI is only on iOS. Um, that one is a, a tool that I still would definitely recommend. It is free. And I call it a camera multi-tool because that's what it is. You can take a picture or you can scan and read text. You have a short text mode where you can just, you know, slide your, you know, just move your camera over something and it'll, it'll recognize like a short block of text immediately after it sees something. You have more of a document mode where you can just fully take a picture of a document and have it read aloud. You can recognize colors, uh, paper currency, it's got a cool, like a scene preview mode where you can, you know, kind of like what Be My Eyes does, but I would argue that if you're looking for like a description of an environment, Be My Eyes currently does way better than Seeing AI does right now. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, there's currency, there's a product barcode feature. So if you want to identify, um, you know, cans of soup that are very similar, like, oh, I can't tell if this is chicken or, or, uh, chicken noodle or tomato, you can uh, find that out. Or you could, use, like I said, there's you can tackle things many different ways. So, so far we can look at something with a magnifier. If we have some vision, we could use Be My Eyes or Be My AI to just try to take a picture of it and see. Or we could use Seeing AI. So we've got a few features here, a few different options. Vision. Double tap and vision. Double tap. And vision is a competitor to... Uh, 
seeing AI and they do largely similar things. All these modes that I talked about, the barcode, the text, the color, the whatever, uh, a lot of the currency, all of these things, um, they do very similar types of things. The difference is, is that Envision is on iOS and Android. So, you know, if you're an Android user, at least you can use Envision AI. So that is on both. So we'll, I won't go into much detail there. One step reader. The one step reader. Uh, one step reader. I don't even remember what that is. I haven't used it all that much. Um, Prismo Go. Double tap to open. Zuzanka. Zuzanka. I have not done a video on this yet because um, I've I've had some luck with it, but I haven't had like consistent luck with it to really be able to show you really well. This is a camera app that is it's geared specifically toward um, trying to find expiration dates on items. So especially in the kitchen, you know, like, oh, when does this milk go bad? Or, oh, I had this thing in my cupboard for six months and forgot about it. Is it still good? Um, it tries to give you some tips on like where you might find um, the type of expiry date information. On certain types of items so in theory it's a really cool idea um, and I've, I have had it work before um, but in other times I you know I haven't had it work so much Prismo Go, Prismo oh, Go I don't really use that anymore again some of these things I've just had on my phones forever honestly in this folder I would say um, my eyes be Double my eyes Seeing AI and Envision AI are Closing essential. One. All of those, if you're on iOS, get them. They're all free. They're all great. Get them, use them, like them. Uh, I want to look at, let's see. Any link viewer. Double tap to open. Okay, yeah. So I need to put this actually in my low vision folder. Let me do that real Edit quick. Mode. Start so editing. Magni link viewer. Delete. Drag Magni link viewer. Sports We're going to put you... Low vision folder. It's stop editing. Drop Magni Link. Add Magni Link viewers. Cancel. Drag. Add Magni Link viewers to low vision folder. Drop complete. There we go. For, finished editing. Forgot to do that before this video. Folder. So let's go into our low vision Opening folder. Low vision folder. Now this is where I put in um, apps that, you know, for, for low vision. Specifically magnifier CCTV type apps. Um, over 40 plus. Over 40 plus was a, you know, and the funny thing is... I used to use these types of apps all the time, but now that we have the built-in magnifier app and it's actually gotten quite good, I don't really use these as much. Um, but over 40 plus, that is an oldie but a goodie. It's a classic one that I used to use all the time before the built-in iOS magnifier got good um, or got included in general. But over 40 plus, that's a really solid one. Supervision plus. Supervision Plus, um, from what I remember, is okay. See it. Double, super, see it. See it? I don't remember. I don't remember what that one. HW Explorer. Double tap. HW Explorer. I kind of get a kick out of this one. This is a humanware magnifier app, and it does work okay. But I find it funny if you're a voiceover user, and come on, humanware, you should know better. Um... The buttons, at least last I checked, do not have labels on them. So you try to go to the plus button, the minus button, the you know any of the interface buttons in there. They're not labeled. And this is humanware. Hopefully they get that fixed because, you know, yes, I know it's intended for low vision. You're maybe meant to have some vision to be able to use this. But, eh, you know, maybe you're a blind person demoing it to um, low vision customers or clients. Um yeah, I, I find that a little amusing. Reebok. Double Magni Link. Reebok. Double tap to open. Rebo no, it's, it says it weird, but it's Reboca. I haven't done a video on this yet this yet, but I intend to. This is a kind of a unique magnifier app. Um that kind of does some I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but um this is one that I if you have really specific low vision needs. Um, and you want a little bit more customization, Reboca, let me... Characters, cap R, E, cap A, O, K, E, H, hotel. R-E-B-O-K-E-H, Reboca. 
Um, I will try to do a video if uh, my mirroring lets me do that, if it, if it will work correctly. Um, because this one does have a couple unique features in it that some people may be interested in. So hopefully expect a video of that in the fairly near future. But that one I would definitely check out. Magnolink Viewer. Magnolink Viewer. This one I just learned about recently, actually. And you can use the basics of it with just your phone. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out. Uh, I think you can change the, the colors, but that's about it. But what this is really meant for is it's really meant to work with, especially if you have an iPad. Um, if you have one of, this is from LVI, and if you have one of their CCTVs, like the LVI, the Magnolink Student, or the um, the... Oh, I forget. I just I forget what their new cameras are called. They have these new cameras that they are meant to work specifically wirelessly with an iPad. And I apologize, I can't remember the names. There's just so many products, it's how hard to keep track of and remember the names of them all. Um, but it's meant to work in conjunction with. Remember back in the day when they had the eBot from Hims, where you could use that with your iPad. This is kind of a similar type of thing, but you basically you're going to have a near and a distance camera. And then if you have the right, you know, their device, you can do OCR with it. But again, and I'll say it here again, you know, there's apps that will do, you know, there are CCTVs out there that do OCR and in a pinch they work okay. But honestly, especially if you're a student, if you're a high school, college student, you're a working professional, you know, I think these apps that I showed you earlier, that I talked about earlier, um, Seeing AI and Vision AI, um, we're, we're going to get into Voice Dream Scanner in a minute, but these apps um, are going to offer you much more easily, um, it's going to be much easier for you to save and copy text and, you know, maybe you want to email it to somebody. Maybe you wanted to save it in uh, in a file. Maybe you want to, I don't know, do whatever with it. But, you know, you don't want it just trapped on a CCTV. So, you know, these hardware devices, the OCR is nice. Um, and if you just want to, like, read things and kind of, you know, throw them away and like, okay, you're good. I just wanted to hear it once and we're good. They're great for that. But if you're wanting to you know, have access to this digital information once you've scanned it. I would say your phone apps are going to offer you a lot more flexibility than using a CCTV. So those are some low vision apps that I would Closing recommend. Low folder. Low books folder. Books. Double and tabs. here's the fun one because I love to read. And there are loads and loads of reading services, reading apps, ways to read things. And as I said before, the first app that Voice I will recommend is open. Voice Dream Reader. On Android, it is called Ledger Reader, or L-E-G-E-R-E. -E. Um, I forget how TalkBack says it, but um, other synthesizers say Ledger Reader, so whatever. Voice Dream Reader is, like, I absolutely love this app. I've been using it for probably well over a decade now. And I, and I still write, this is the one app that is a paid app. But if you have any interest in reading anything, I still think it's well worth the money. Because earlier this year, they switched it from a one-time purchase to a yearly subscription model. You have a trial period, but you have a one-year subscription. I believe it's like 30 bucks a year. Um, and you know, if you're an existing user, you can keep using it the way you always have. But if you are a new user and do not have voice dream reader yet, um, you're going to be in that subscription thing. So like I said, even though it's 30 bucks a year, if I was a new user or if they said, no, existing users, you got to pay your subscription too. I would do it. I, I would absolutely have no problem paying 30 bucks a year for this app. Why? Because I can read Bookshare books with it. 
if you're a high school or college student or if you just love to read and you want to download novels and stuff, Bookshare is awesome. You know, you get your free student membership or if you're not a student, you pay, what is it, like 70 bucks a year now? It went from 50 to like 70 or something. But you can download as many books as you want. You can get as many books as you want. So you can read Bookshare books. You can read text files, Word documents, PowerPoints, PDF files, EPUB, um, audio files. Like I've got a couple of ripped, um, like ripped MP3 books that I and you can put them in like a zip file and you can just put your MP3 book in there. I have a couple. I, even uniquely, I've even used it for. I've got, I've treated um, like an audio TV series as an audio book. So let's say like I have the, I have the descriptive audio files for Cobra Kai. And I just put them in a zip file and I have them like, I have five of them right now because there are five seasons out. And if I want to kick back and listen to some Cobra Kai, you know, you don't have the video. Um, but it's just the descriptive audio tracks, and I can listen to basically the audio version of Cobra Kai, and that's in my voice stream folder. And you can put make everything into their own folders. So if you got subject matter you want to put it into, you've got a certain series, you've got a certain off author, um, you know whatever. Um, you know I've got a tech and gaming folder, I've got a disability folder, I've got a you know whatever. Um, you can do all those things, but then on top of that, you have what they call voice dream scanner. You can get it as a standalone voice app, which can work in a pinch and I'll use that from time to time, but it also integrates the scanner feature into voice dream reader, at least on iOS on Android. It doesn't seem like that's been integrated just yet. Um, but what's cool about voice dream scanner is, okay, I'm in voice dream reader and there's something I want to read. Let's say I get emailed a PDF from school and I go to open it. I try to read it with voiceover and it just ticks at me. It, it doesn't read anything. So I go into my, I, you know, I'm in my mail app. I'm in my PDF file. I hit the share button. I share it to Voice Dream Reader. It puts it into the top of my list uh, of wherever I'm at in Voice Dream Reader. And the next time I open it, you'll get a dialog that says, hey, this document appears to be a scan. Would you like to perform OCR on it? And I say, yes, as a matter of fact, I would. And it'll grab all the text out of it. It'll suck all, all the text out of it and make it actually readable. And the nice thing about that is, is also when it does that, it's already saved. It's just already made that PDF file accessible. I don't have to copy and paste it. I don't have to remember to save it somewhere. As long as I share that PDF file or whatever into Voice Dream Reader and then I do the OCR on it, um, it'll be there. Like just the other day, um, we were trying to get the Reload magazine, uh, that retro first person shooter magazine that I've been reading and that I uh, got an article in a while back. Uh, issue 2 came out and <laughs> they're going to work on it for the future, but they, um, they couldn't the way that their software that they were using, I guess, was horrible for accessibility. They tried to make it accessible, but I, for this issue, I ended up having to use OCR to make it fully readable. So, you know, again, whether you're in work or school or you just get something out of the blue, great for that. And then also in Voice Dream Scanner, you can just add it via, you know, you can go into Voice Dream Reader. You can say, I want to add a document. I want to add it for a scanner. And it opens up a camera interface where you just take a picture of a page and then it'll ask you to keep it or to save it. And then you give it a name and then boom, you're, you know, again, I use the example when I do assessments with people, you're in a class, your teacher, your instructor gives you a handout and says, read this. I know we're going to talk about it in five minutes or you'll need this for the test. I use my camera, snap a picture. I'm in my history folder, boom, I've got the document and it's done. And now I have my textbook and I have this extra PD or this extra paper document right in that folder now that I can use to study for the test. 
So voice stream reader, very, very powerful. It can just read, you know, and it, and it imports from things like Google Drive, Dropbox, iCloud. Very, very useful app. I really couldn't live without it. Um, Bard Mobile is another one. If Bard you Mobile. are familiar with the Bard Talking Book program, maybe you had cassette tapes way back in the day because you're old like me. Or maybe you've heard of the digital cartridges that they have out now. They've had that out for the past several years. Well, you don't even have to get a hardware player anymore because you can just you, you can be issued a username and password, and you can search for and download human narrated audiobooks yourself uh, right in this app. And this is not meant necessarily for textbooks. You you might find some literature books in here if you have them, if you need them. Um, but this is more for recreational reading, your novels, your magazines, all that kind of a stuff. If you are looking for more textbooks and Bookshare doesn't have them, and you're not using like Voice Dream Reader to read them, there's another app called Learning Ally. And those are more focused, especially K-12. Um, those, the Learning Ally app and the Learning Ally service is more geared toward textbooks. That's its focus. And those books are typically a combination of human narrated audio, but then you also have the text. So it's nice if, let's say, you're reading a science book and you need to know how to spell a term for the test, you can be listening with the human narration, pause it, go up into the body of your text with voiceover, navigate by word, find that word in your document, and then, you know, read it by letter by letter. And I go, oh, that's how you spell photosynthesis. Okay, I, hmm, I wouldn't know how to spell that. Um, so it's a really nice combination of print and human narrated audio. Because especially for people who are low vision or people who are just getting used to text-to-speech screen readers or listening to things rather than visually reading them, you know, people like to have more human uh, sounding voices and human narration, of course, will be better, you know, for that. And I forgot to mention with voice dream, they do have loads and loads of voices that you can sample and then you can buy them for like a buck or two a piece. And, you know, they have male voices, female voices, anywhere from, you know, uh, American English, Australian English, UK English, but then they have other languages. So if you speak another language, or you're taking another language class and you want to make sure that the speech, you know, the voice that you're using, if you're reading a foreign language, that it will read a little bit more accurately. Um, they have, like I said, literally probably a few dozen voices out there that you can sample and then pick up. <clears throat> so again, a voice stream reader, very powerful. You've got Learning Ally, you've got Bard, you know, you have Kindle. And I read a fair few Kindle books. And the Kindle works really well with both voiceover and talkback. But I do have a disclaimer for you. Before you buy a Kindle book, go to the Amazon website, whether it's on your phone or on your computer. Go look, look for the book you want to buy on the Amazon Kindle website. And look for it on the website. Under the details, the book details section, you know, you have the page numbers, ISBN, and all the other Kindle features that it supports. There are two lines in there. There is one that says text-to-speech, and there's another one that says screen reader. So if it says text-to-speech enabled, screen reader supported, go ahead and buy the book. You're good. Um, if it says not supported or disabled, do not buy that book. If you need audio, if you need voiceover or talkback to read it, if you open, if you buy and open that book, you'll just get a pop-up that says text-to-speech has been disabled by publisher. And yes, it is the publisher's fault. Um, I trust me. Is and this is especially bad for textbooks. Some textbooks work. But a lot of them don't, and textbook publishers, I'm just going to go right out and say it, they're stupid because they are purposely blocking an accessibility feature from working that would make everyone's life easier, it would make their life easier, it would make our lives easier, 
um, but instead you have to jump through hoops to try to find another accessible version of it. And if they would just make their dang Kindle book accessible, it would be great. But I have found a few books. I found one literally just the other day. Uh, it was on the history of like mobile or like handheld gaming, you know, your Game Boy, Game Gear. And I wanted to read that, um, but that Kindle book was not accessible. So unfortunately, I did not buy it, and I'm going to have to maybe talk to the, find information for the publisher and see if I can get it in another format. So again, publishers are blocking that particular feature. That is my, that is my warning. Kindle works very, very well um, if the publishers aren't stupid and block that text-to-speech feature. Double. Double Audible uh, is a very popular mainstream service you don't need a disability for, um, but a lot of people use it. I use it all the time. Uh, these are human narrated audiobooks. They've got gazillions of books. They've got some actual audio courses now that are really kind of cool. Um, they've started doing podcasts and even some stand up things in there, like stand up comedy stuff in there. So, like, there's Tons and tons of stuff. Now, you don't want to just buy audiobooks. You don't want to buy an audiobook outright because they're expensive. If you're going to do audio, you want to do a membership program. One book a month, two books a month, whatever. Because not only do you get um, like one or two credits per month and you, it saves you a lot of money, but you also, as a member, you get daily deals. Uh, literally, you, you, you're picking up books for a buck, two bucks, anywhere from like one to five bucks. They have buy, you know, if you have, let's say you have three credits built up, they'll have a sale for a week or two. It'll be like, oh, buy one, get one free or two for one. Or they'll have, you know, member sales where you can get a bunch of books for under five bucks. So if you're a member, you get just exponentially way more deals than just going out and buying an audiobook flat out. So that is my advice for Audible. Goodreads is a it's a great site if you want to share if you want to share your reading experience with your friends, or even if you just want to keep track of what you read. Um, that I found it really handy. It's like, well, oh, what was that one book that I read? And I remember it was about this, and then I could just kind of look through my reading history, and I can do that. Um, I do a reading challenge every year. You know, at the beginning of the year, they say set a reading challenge, and you know, lately, you know, any I could read anywhere from. 75 to 100 or more books um because like i said i love to read um good reader double tap to open good reader learning ally audiobooks cat tie um double tap there's a few other ones like uh good reader there's another one called easy reader i would say they're kind of like voice dream reader but i still prefer um i think just voice dream is just so polished and it I, i i just really really like what it does um, but Easy Reader is another good alternative. Um, but yeah, I, I, I personally I would recommend Voice Dream. Closing books folder. Uh, books I'm folder. not really going to go with all through my po- my productivity, but this is where I put things like you know uh, all my uh, Microsoft Office things for iOS, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, Google Slides. Uh, any any note taking apps? Um, there's an app called Noted, N O T E D, that is really cool. Um, I haven't used it in a while, so hopefully the accessibility didn't break. But I talked about audio recorders earlier, and what's really cool about Noted is if you want to synchronize text notes and audio notes. Let's say you're recording a lecture in class. And then you have a Bluetooth keyboard hooked up to your phone. You're you're recording the uh, instructor, but then you're taking your own text notes. It combines that into one screen. So at the top, I think it is, you have like your play, pause, your record, your whatever. And then the whole other part of the screen is just your body of text. And you can, um, you know, type your notes. And then when you go back and review them, uh, let's say that you're like, what did I mean by this? You're reading uh, something that you wrote down. You're like, what did I mean by that? I can tap that line of text or double tap it if I have voiceover and it'll jump to that part of the lecture so I can kind of listen. Oh, that's what the instructor was talking about. That's what I meant. Um, and you can do vice versa. If you were listening to the lecture over or a meeting over or whatever, you could see it would kind of follow along and then you could see what you wrote down um, 
during that part of the presentation or class. So very cool app. Those are a couple of things in the productivity. Um, then I have a movies, movies folder. folder. You know, this is, uh, I mean, this, you know, all of your mainstream stuff generally works pretty well. Like I use YouTube constantly, Netflix, Paramount, uh, Max, um, YouTube TV, um, Hulu, just all of those types of things generally work reasonably well. Music folder, eight apps. Music folder, you know, again, self-explanatory, but if you have like your, I put like my, um, I don't really use Apple Music, but if you use that, I use YouTube Music. Um, we have, you know, like I, I put stuff in there for like iHeartRadio, if you want to listen to like your local radio station and you're out of town or something, or maybe you want to listen to a football game that you want to and you're not around, uh, it's great for that. So things like iHeartRadio. So again, these are some mainstream apps. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit at the end, because right now I'm focusing on apps that are specifically designed for people who are blind or low vision. Um, but I will definitely talk a little bit at the end about just mainstream apps in general. Utilities folder, 25 apps. Utilities, the, again, this, these aren't blindness apps. These are things like this is where I put all my, like, I have a speed test. So if I need to check my internet connections being wonky, I have my, um, I have my Xfinity, uh, router app thingy in here. I've got, um, all my authenticators, you know, your Microsoft, your Google authenticator. That's where I put those types of things. Social folder, 21 apps. Social, self-explanatory, your Facebooks, your LinkedIn, your X slash Twitter, you know, anything like that, that's what I put in there. And most of those work really well. I mainly focus on Twitter or X as they call it now. That's that's my social network. But I do have a LinkedIn thing as well. Navigation folder, 16 apps. Navigation. Now, I don't do as much with open this as, a, as much as I used to because I don't travel near as much. Um, but you can use Apple Maps. You can use Google Maps. Those work with VoiceOver. There's another one called Lazarillo. Um, my coworker really recommends that one. He he he's totally blind and he he works with Lazarillo quite a bit. That one is on both iOS and Android. There is another app called Good Maps um, that he says it works okay, except for the problem with that one. What he said because I talked to him recently about this is, let's say you're navigating, you're walking a route. And you want to lock your screen to save battery. Well, the problem is, is apparently in Good Maps, you have to have your screen unlocked. Otherwise, it will stop giving you announcements. So, again, maybe you're trying to save battery or you're just walking and you don't want to keep bumping the screen or something. Um, that's kind of unfortunate. So, I really hope they do update that so that more background announcements are announced. There's another one called Blind Square that I've used a bit, and this one is really nice because it tells you what's around you. Um, you know, it can tell you as you're walking or driving, like what intersections you're coming up to. Let's say that I show up to an appointment 30 minutes early or something, and I'm like, well, let's walk around and see if there's a coffee shop nearby or, a, you know, maybe a bank or something. And as I'm walking, it'd be like, oh, McDonald's at three o'clock, um, Wells Fargo at eight o'clock. Um, you know, it'll kind of tell you what, you know, especially if you're in a new area, it can be really helpful. And you can even customize, I don't want, you know, I want to hear about these types of points of interest, but I don't care about these. Like uh, maybe I want to hear about coffee shops and grocery stores and banks, but I don't want to hear about like pet stores or, uh, auto mechanics or, you know, like whatever category, I'm just making stuff up, but there's a whole list of categories and you can say, I want to hear about all of them, or I want to hear about only these and not these. Um, it's really, it's really helpful, especially if you're for pedestrian walking, it's really nice. Um, those are the ones that I mainly use. Um, I know happen? there are other ones out there. And again, when we wrap up, I'm going to talk a little bit about a resource that I highly encourage people to use or a couple of resources that I would encourage people to use travel folder 11 travel um I don't think I have any blindness specific apps in these but two apps I do really want to mention 
or three apps I want to mention is Uber, Lyft, and Transit, or it's sometimes it's called Transit app. Um, Uber and Lyft are basically like taxis or like door-to-door -door services, but they're awesome. You don't have to carry cash. You just put your payment information in there. You put in your address where you are, and a lot of times it'll just detect where you are. You just want to verify it. You say, I'm here. I want to go here. And it'll tell you what your estimated um, like pickup time will be, your arrival time will be. It'll give an estimate about your price. It'll tell you what your price is going to be. And you can say, book it. And then poof, with usually within like five, ten minutes tops, you've got a ride. And then when you're done, you rate the driver, you pay them, you tip them, and boom, you're on your way. Um, I like I use Uber sometimes, but I, I'm more of a Lyft user, and I love it. It's come in, I can't tell you how much it's come in handy. These are super, super helpful. And of course, the Transit app is just what it sounds like. It is for if you're in a city that has some kind of a transit system, bus, light rail, subway um, you can get those types of routes and information so um, that is a good app and you may also depending on the city that you're in you may want to look because they may have an app specifically for your uh, transit system like Minneapolis St. Paul they do have one for their their metro transit system there's a separate app for that um, so there's a couple options there but those are a couple ones you know there's some taxi services um I forget what the, I haven't used a taxi in a long time though. I know because when I tried it back in the day, maybe it's better now, but like when I tried it several years ago, the taxi drivers seemed kind of hesitant about it. Like I, I, I set up everything through the app like I would through Lyft or Uber and they were like, well, I got done with the ride and like, oh, you, you pay me now. I'm like, no, you'll get it through the app. I, I pay you through the app. I'm like, no, you give me money. I'm like, and I, I finally just let them know. It's like, no, you will get paid. I pay through the app. So maybe they understand that more. Maybe it's just become more of a thing now. Um, but yeah, Uber and Lyft, great apps. Shopping folder, 25 apps. Shopping, um, Amazon, of course. The Amazon app is quite accessible. Um, I use it quite frequently, not just for shopping, but even for checking my order. It's like, oh, is this going to show up today? Um, grocery delivery apps. If you have something like Instacart, God bless Instacart, because especially we're just on the verge of winter right now, and the sidewalks suck, they're icy, they're snowy. I have a grocery store right near me, but, you know, it, you know again... If you're blind or low vision, you have to get to the store. You may need to find assistance to find what you're looking for on the shelves. So you may need shopping assistance. And then you got to remember, you can only carry so much home. If you're walking home or you're taking the bus home, even you can only carry so much. Or I can just fire up the old handy dandy Instacart or other grocery delivery app and I, you know, if I wake up at three in the morning and think, yeah, I should get groceries tomorrow, I can add things to my cart, say that, oh, I want it delivered between 10 and 11 or 11 and noon or whatever, um, set that up and they will shop, they will deliver it and boom, it's right to your door. They'll call you when they, when they show up or you meet them outside and you got your groceries. Um, it is a wonderful, a wonderful accessibility thing. Because, you know, time is money as well. You know, if it takes, even if I'm, if I can kind of see what's on the shelves, it might take me an hour to do what somebody can get done in five, ten minutes to try to find what's on the shelf. And then again, getting it home. Um, so, you know, not just Instacart, but your low, again, your local grocery store may have a delivery um, service. Like I think Walmart's starting to do it. A lot of other grocery chains are starting to do it. Um you know, and, you know, there are apps for shopping and, you know, like Best Buy or, you know, any any store. Like, I'm sure Walmart, Target, they all have their apps, those kinds of things. Finance folder, 13 apps. Finance. This is something, again, not specifically blindness related. 
this is what we're getting into now is we're getting into more apps that are just general apps that everybody can use. And this is a good time to bring it up. Um, the first several folders or were largely apps for blind and low vision specifically. But what makes the iPhone or iPad or Android device more just such an amazing tool is that, yeah, you've got these things that are, you know, that are for blind, low vision. But then all these other tools and all these other apps that people, like, you know, that non-disabled people will use as a convenience or just use because, um, they can be like an essential tool. You know, they may be a convenience for sighted users, but they're essential for us. So again, shopping, um, tra travel, be it buses or Uber, Lyft, taxis, um, GPS to get directions. And then you have the finance folder. This is where I keep all my, I've got my bank app in there. I've got all my bill pay apps, I, you know, whether I've got a credit card or whether I've got my electric bill, my phone bill, my cable bill, my, you know, you name it, whatever it is. I can check my bank balance. I pay my rent. Um, when you start living on your own, guess what? You got to do these things. And it's made it so much easier. You don't have to write checks out anymore. Um, you know, a lot of times you just, you can either set it up directly through your bank or a lot of the services themselves will just have an app. Then you just link your either your debit or credit card or your bank account. And then you just pay your bill or you set it up for auto pay, whatever. Um, but very, very important folder there, your finance folder. Again, these are all folders that I created. AR folder, two apps. AR folder, two apps. Okay. Uh, so, and that's, that's largely... Uh, all this other stuff is just kind of supplementary. Like I've got some a, a couple AR things. Nothing too important in there right now. Sports folder. Four apps. I've got a sports in there, so I got like my Vikings app and whatever. Weather folder. Two apps. I've got a weather folder. A um, couple that people like is you know the built-in weather app. I loved Dark Sky until Apple took it over. Um, weather Gods is another one that people have liked. I like their notifications that they do, so I do have that. I, I do like their notifications that they give you, like your daily summary, um, you know, your upcoming weather type of things. I, I do miss Dark Sky, the way it worked, but um, and then double tap overcast. Double I tap use overcast, but you can use the podcast app. You can use um, let's see, what uh, there's another podcast app that everyone uses. I can't remember. Um, but podcasts are another, you know, common way. There's a lot of blind and vision impaired podcasts out there. And then, then there's just podcasts for everything. I do a lot of, or listen to a lot of tech and gaming podcasts, some sciencey things, some nerdy podcasts, just some entertaining, you know, humorous podcasts. Um, so that's largely an overview of just some of the useful things you can do with your phone. Again, you've got your built-in tools You've got magnification. I can zoom into things on my screen. I can use my ca phone's camera to turn my phone into a CCTV. Works beautifully. I've got a screen reader via voiceover or talkback. I've got other little accessibility features depending on iOS or Android. You know, again, look under your settings and accessibility. And then you have all these apps. You know, again... Um, be My Eyes, Seeing AI, Envision AI, uh, Voice Dream Reader, uh, Bard Mobile, Kindle, Audible. And there's all kinds of, like, your. I'm sure your library has, like, some kind of an app if you want to go through your library system. You know, there's all kinds of other reading apps as well. Um, you know, productivity, you've got things like your Just Press Record for voice memos if you want more of advanced things there. You've got <clears throat> travel and transportation, Uber, Lyft, Transit, um, Blind Square, Lazarillo, Good Maps, Apple Maps, uh, Google Maps. You've got your shopping apps, your Amazon, your grocery delivery, Instacart. You've got... Um, 
you know, you can do your finances, your banking, your bill pay, your, all Do-up. those types of things. Your Double social tap, media. Um, you know, social media can be important because I use that a lot to like, I'll ask questions uh, if I'm having trouble with something or if I'm wondering if something might be accessible or whatever. You know, I follow tech companies. I follow game companies. I follow accessible advocates on social media, on Twitter. Uh, very useful. Even, you know, just having the YouTube app, if there's something... You know, or the Go- or the Google app specifically. I could, you know, I'm like earlier this morning. I, I I needed to figure out how to do something on my Android phone that I hadn't used in a while, and so I just looked it up, and within like a couple seconds, I found it. Um, you know, and you're not gonna know or remember everything, but again, you've, if you've got your phone on you and you know how to use your assistive technology, you know, it's more about can you find the information that you need so that you can quickly stay and remain productive. You know, um, I don't have to go, well, I need to find a trainer or I need somebody to walk me through this. I can, if I know how to use my assistive technology, if I know how to use Google, I know how to use YouTube and I, I look up a video, I look up a article, I'm like, oh, that's how I do it. Okay, boom, got it, done. Um, so yes, there are all of these tools that are geared specifically toward blind and low vision users. But there are just as many, um, and there are even more tools that, you know, like I said, are just conveniences, and they're useful for sighted um, users, but they can be essential for us so that we can remain, we can become and remain independent. Again, whether you're in school and need to read a lot or take notes, if you're in college reading, take notes or anything, if you're in work, if you're in living on your own, you need to pay your bills, you need to shop, you need to look up information, communicate. Um, there's just so many things. I, I, you know, I always say that technology won't fix every problem. It's not going to solve everything, but it sure helps. Folder. Four apps. It Double sure helps. Um, just the amount of things that you can do with the device that you can fit in the palm of your hand. I know they call it a phone, but like I said, you get in people that are kind of, you know, that are, you know, that, that have never used a smartphone before or really wonder why, or what is the appeal? I don't care about phones. I don't want a cell phone with me. You, for all I, you know, you could get a, basically a cell phone plan. You could put it on a do not disturb um, most of the time, and then you won't really get calls but if you need to use the data, like I said, you, some stuff uses the, the cloud and you know, you're getting GPS directions or it's doing OCR or it's processing things, in, you know, information from like Be My AI. Um, it, your phone is basically a computer first, a phone second. That's the way I look at it. And it's a mighty, mighty useful computer at that that fits in the palm of your hand or your pocket. Um, and that's really about it. I mean, the only other things that I would add is, you know, I have a whole other screen Sports folder, page three, if- and it would take me forever to go all through all these. Um, but all of this whole screen here is just iOS games and I have folders just game to show folder, you 23 apps, 20 so items. game services. Double that's like my Xbox, my steam, my PlayStation app, essential games folder, 43 apps. essential games. Double These are kind of low vision games that I can play that I just really love. Audio games folder, tw- essential so games folder, 43 apps, 43 Double of those. Games folder, 28 apps. I've got Double 28 tap. audio games, voiceover games folder, 81 apps, 81 tap voiceover tap games. games, Nintendo folder, four apps. There's a got Double my Nintendo folder with like Mario run and a couple other odds and ends. Apple arcade folder. 12 apps. Apple Arcade. Blindfold Games folder. 29 apps. There's a separate folder for Blindfold Games because he's got a boatload of those. Word Games folder. 11 apps. Word Games. Those are voiceover accessible word games. And how many of those? Word Games folder. 11 apps. 11 of those. Music Games folder. 3 apps. A couple of music games. Zombie Exodus. And then a few apps, the games that I haven't really gotten around to trying yet. So, you know, again, there's just, I focus mainly on independence and education and productivity here. Um... But there are, you know, whether it's watching video, listening to music, or playing a game, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do on your phone, too. And what I would wrap up with is, um, again, this is meant to be an introduction 
There's no way I could give you a comprehensive look at everything because this would be a seven hour video, if not longer. I would encourage people, if you're an iOS user or a potential iOS user, go to AppleViz, www.appleviz.com. It is a good resource. It's a very, um, it's a very popular, it's a very active community. There, they have an accessible app directory, so you can, you know, you can go into the app directory and say, I want to find a good note-taking app or a good GPS app or a good game to play. Uh, and they rank things on how accessible, how voiceover blind accessible they are. They have podcasts, they have user forums, etc. There, um, there is another site if you are an Android user called Accessible Android. It seems to be the most current. It seems to be the most updated one. It's not, from what I can tell, it's not quite as extensive as AppleViz is right now. But again, they have articles and reviews, they have podcasts, and they do have an accessible Android app directory. So AppleViz, Inclusive Android, or not Inclusive Android, that one was another one out there, but I, that one hasn't been updated in a while, but Accessible Android. And I'll try to remember to put links in the description for those as well. Um, so check those out. And again, you know, any of these apps, I, t I gave a brief overview of them. But if you want to learn more in detail, you want to see some hands-on demos of a lot of these apps, check out my iOS Accessible App Spotlight video playlist. Or you can check out my iOS Low Vision Spotlight or iOS Accessible Game Spotlight playlists as well for accessible and low vision friendly games. And I think that's uh, I think that's it. Uh, that is an updated overview of uh, accessible mobile accessible apps and features to kind of get somebody started if you uh, are wanting to get into using a smartphone or tablet. Hope you guys found the information helpful. Hope you liked the video. Give it a like if you did. Follow me on Twitter at BGFH79. Twitch.tv slash Illegally Cited. IllegallyCited.com. And right here on YouTube. Until next time, I will chat with everyone again later.